everybody. I'm John Van Duzer, CPA and partner with James Moore and Company, and I'm here with Dave McGuire, um, shareholder of McGuire Sponsor, which is a specialty tax firm. And Dave is the expert and knows everything, um, I say it facetiously, but he really does, um, about cost segregations. Um, so cost segregations are one of my favorite strategies for a real estate investor. And so I thought it would be great to be able to pick Dave's brain um, and get more information on these things. So Dave, if we could just jump right in, um, why don't you tell us in real general terms what a cost segregation study is and why it's important? Yeah, so in general, it's a pretty simple concept, John, and I appreciate you uh, bringing me on to talk today about it. But in general, it's a pretty simple concept. The idea is most real estate is depreciated over 39 or 27 and a half years. So if you have a, a standard warehouse and you pay 3.9 million for it, the IRS allows you to take a depreciation deduction of 139 or $100,000 every year. A cost segregation study, what it does is it recognizes certain things in the building that behave more like equipment than they do building, whether that be specialty wiring or a parking lot that's 15 year or other things that can be either five, seven, or 15 year according to the IRS. And it breaks it out and allows you to accelerate those deductions and move them into early years of the investment. So what happens is you save money and get more depreciation early in your investment, save on your taxes, which you can then reinvest and use to, um, uh, based on time value of money, you can use to reinvest in your business, you can use to pay down debt, you can use just to, uh, I have one client that went out and bought a boat, don't recommend that one, but, <laughs> but we have had clients that, that have done things like that as well. But the idea is you're getting your money out now. So you get to play that time value of money. Right. Um, one I thing I've heard. A, I think that's a huge thing. So I think you and I are having dinner one time and, you know, I said, hey, it's like getting an interest free loan from the government. And, and you were mm -hmm. like, well, not doing a cost segregation study is like giving an interest free loan to the government, um, which I think is. It, a cool it, way to it, look it, at. It. And that's the way I've. Uh, so I used to always say it was getting an interest free loan until I had a client point out it's actually the other way around, is if the IRS says you can do this, by not doing it, you're letting the IRS and the government hold on to your money. And that's never a good thing. Um, I mean, I'd love to be able to pay off all my debts 30 years from now and not worry about it today, but that's not the way things work. So we know that time value of money is a thing, and we don't wanna be giving the IRS our money to hold on to for 40 years. Yeah, absolutely. So when you look at a cost segregation study, one of the things I like about your proposals is you attempt to quantify the benefit uh, of mm -hmm. the of the cost segregation study. Maybe you could explain real quick, you know, kind of your approach and the way you look at it, because I, I think it's a very helpful measure just to see what that benefit is. Yeah. So so what we always say is I don't know when it makes sense for a business to do a cost segregation study. What I do know is how much money they can save. But what I can't tell them is what type of return they need to see on their investment. So when you call me with a client that needs a cost segregation study, you'll say, Dave, we've got a client, they built a manufacturing facility and spent $5 million doing it, or they acquired a apartment complex for, for $2 million. What we do is we gather some basic information and we benchmark it against other properties we've seen that are similar in scope. And by doing that, I can tell you pretty closely how much five, seven, and 15-year property we'll be able to find. And then I can compare the depreciation they'll get with a study to the depreciation they would be seeing without it. And then we can make some assumptions as to tax rates and discount rates and really come up with a savings. And when I do that, as you know, John, we always try to undersell. Um, I'd much rather tell them we're going to see a low benefit and then have it come in higher then tell somebody they're going to see a high benefit and have it come in lower right and so you're showing that benefit um so to be clear depreciation is a zero-sum game you're not going to get more depreciation on a property by doing a cost segregation study but it's the timing of that depreciation right you're going to get more depreciation earlier that you can use to benefit and offset your taxes now presumably reinvest that those savings at some rate of return in the future. And then, you know, when you would normally be getting more depreciation, you'll be getting less. So it um, correct, there's correct. a time value of money component there. And that's how you can really demonstrate that return. Now, when you're looking at a property, what factors tend to indicate that 
um, some things would be better for a cost segregation study or a better um, a better candidate for a cost segregation study? It, it really, it depends on the type of property. So when we're talking about a manufacturing facility or, or something like that, we're typically looking at the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the things that are specialized to that specific industry. So for example, in a, warehouse, in a manufacturing facility, we're looking at specialty HVAC systems, wiring that's there for the equipment, plumbing that's there for the equipment. Offices get a little different. There we're looking at what are the levels of carpeting? What are the electrical levels of decorative lighting systems? Do they have movable partitions? Um, and, and what actually gets odd, and sometimes people go, well, so that means you're, if you spend more money, you typically are better. And sometimes, but not always. For example, carpet is more likely to be reclassified than a marble floor that's put in. So sometimes people go and they say, I spent a lot of money on this. I put in really high end flooring and you go in and it's a marble floor and they put in um, gold fixtures and everything else that might not move the needle, but it's the things like the cabinetry, the carpeting, the flooring, the specialty wiring systems, uh, right. medical office buildings, medical piping, those kind of things make a huge difference in terms of the dollar amounts. And, and really right now, as you know, John, they pushed for under the tax cut, the jobs act, we now have a hundred percent bonus depreciation. So, even the things like the parking lot, when we can move those, we can write those off immediately. Right. So you might think of a warehouse and go, there's not a lot going on with a warehouse. And then you realize 20% of it is related to the parking lot outside. And all of that can be moved and written off immediately in the first year. Right. And we've seen that a lot where with the studies that have come across my desk is land improvements is a big deal, especially, you know, multifamily. If you think about any common areas with a pool, or improvements like that, that all is, you know, falling under that land improvements category. And um, right now, under the current bonus depreciation rules, it can be written off in year one, um, which tends to really make your your time value of money thing pretty stark when you have a really large deduction coming through in year one. Um, so kind of the inverse of that question, what factors would cause a cost segregation study to not be as beneficial? You mentioned marble flooring. So what that's referring to is the flooring is a tile type in nature or affixed to the property so it's classified as real property but what other kind of factors would cause it to not be as beneficial or what properties wouldn't be a great candidate well one of the main things is going to be um the 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 tax position of the company so it's not necessarily the building most buildings we can find something unless it's too small um or really i mean if you have a a dirt road leading up to a dirt parking lot with a pole barn with no electricity in it, um, which which sounds odd, but we've done we, we have been called on some in uh, some parts of Amish country in Ohio where there's nothing going on at that building other than they don't have any lights in it, they don't have any parking lot, and um, and it's just for horse and buggy. But in general, most buildings have something they can qualify. But if the taxpayer doesn't have tax liability. That is something we have to balance because they might not need the deductions. Um, so it might be a situation where they don't need the deductions. We have to watch out for other things in, in that regard in terms of 1031 exchanges. What is the basis of the property being exchanged? What's the basis of the, the purchase price of the property being acquired? There's a lot of things that we have to balance in certain complicated transactions, but it typically has more to do with the depreciable basis and the tax uh, situation of the company more than the the type of real estate, um, but obviously manufacturing is going to be better than office, uh, medical office or sorry, man, and manufacturing is definitely better than warehouse. Medical office is going to be better than just a accounting office, um, but depending on the level of fixtures, I mean, uh, James Moore has a pretty fancy office space there, so you guys might have a little bit more, but um, but in general. Um, the the level of the fixtures, the more it goes up, the more you're going to see something. A, right. a base level warehouse is going to be a little limited. So class A office space usually is pretty good. But then, like you said, if you have a warehouse that's literally a, a core of a building and it's open space on the inside, there, there's not anything there to reclass. Um, Correct. And, so and, and, and oh. oh, go ahead. I was just I was just going to say the other thing that is um, like with residential, we talked about the residential. And you mentioned how land improvements can shift to residential. 
what we'll see is someone will have two residential properties, both that they acquired for $10 million, and one is in a suburban area. So the land improvements could be 10, 15% of that. Another one is in an urban area in a high rise and they don't have any parking or anything else. And that can lower the percentage reclassification, even though they look relatively comparable, they've got a similar purchase price, maybe a similar number of units, but the where they spent their money might be a little different. Right, so it's a facts and circumstances um, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of my last question is with, you know, the results of the election are taking shape. So James Moore, we've done a few webinars on the election results and kind of have thoughts going forward. What is your view on cost segregations going forward? Well, right now, right now, we it, it's something you want to look at seriously for for there's probably three or four reasons. The first one being is right now we're in 2020. Um, I'm not sure 100% when this is getting released, but we're in 2020 as we're recording this, and people are going through 2020 tax planning. One thing we have right now is what's called a five-year NOL carryback. So as part of the CARES Act, in order to flush money into the system, the Congress implemented a five-year NOL carryback. So if you're in a loss position for 2020, you can maximize that loss and then carry it back to 2015 mm -hmm. and potentially 2016 which those tax rates are were just as high as anything in Joe Biden's tax plan. Right now, Joe Biden's tax plan is a 39.6 rate, which is only 2% right. higher on the individual level. But the bigger thing is the loss of the 199A deduction. Um, additionally, we the corporate rate would go up, but the corporate rate would not go up as high as it was prior to the TCJA and the changes that occurred 1118. So if you can use that NOL carryback, that's worth looking. But the other thing, honestly, John, is um, I don't think tax rates are going to go up anywhere near what is stated in the Joe Biden tax policy. Um, mm -hmm. Even even if the Democrats win the runoffs on January 5th in um, Georgia, I don't foresee that really changing significantly. Um, normally, these things get tempered a little bit when they actually try to get them passed because it's very difficult to push a tax policy of that level. Right. Um, and, that, and, and so especially, yeah. That, that's our view as well. I, I feel like given that there's very, very thin margins in Congress um, and the Senate possibly could be sen uh, Republican controlled, you know, there's going to be a lot of negotiation. And, and I think that mm -hmm. is going to lead to maybe a more moderate tax policy than what has been presented. Um, I do think, though, on an ongoing basis, you know, this continues to be a valuable strategy because so far, one thing I've noticed is there hasn't really been any talk of anything really technical like this, like changes to depreciation or changes to property classifications, changes to the, you know, the methodology of a cost segregation study. It's all focused on rates and who can benefit from what. So, you know, this may be one of the core strategies in the next administration as tax rates are going up. And, and you can really benefit um, from that. Yeah, uh, no, and, and I think I think the, uh, I mean, as we look forward, the other thing to consider is um, when we're talking about cost segregation is not just tax rates, but also the this just where the economy is. And so there's two things going into that. We saw a lot of people when, Ob uh, when Obama was elected um, back in 2008, hold off on depreciation studies because they were concerned about tax rates increases but yet the problem is the economy went down and people didn't needed the cash earlier and by the time they actually went to implement the strategies it was too late or the other thing that people need to be concerned about is because of covid there's been a lot of stimuli measures going in and one of the things to consider is will that trigger any type of inflation and if it will trigger any type of inflation a time value of money calculator is going to tell you to get your money out now and invest it in some type of hedge against inflation. Don't leave it in there to the point where those deductions are worthless in five years because you get some type of inflationary pressure. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, so that's all the time we have for this video. Um, so this is going to be a series. So join us for the next video. And, and Dave's going to give us maybe some surprising things that would qualify for bonus depreciation under a cost segregation study. So I can't wait to see that. And as always, feel free to visit our website, www.jmco.com. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.